One book that's changed the world like no other. One story within of a kingdom created, ruined, then made new. And one person to whom it all points, Jesus Christ. This is God's big picture. So we start with the Bible. This book has had a deeper impact on human history than any other. It has inspired great works of art and literature, shaped whole cultures, and still today leads vast numbers to give their lives to Jesus Christ. And yet many people, even Christians, know little about what's actually in it. We might have our favorite passages, but for many of us, much of scripture remains uncharted territory, especially the Old Testament. My ambitious aim with God's big picture is to give you an overview of the whole Bible so you can see how it all fits together. And my longing is that it will help you grow in knowledge and love of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one to whom it all points. The course consists of nine units, each with a talk and a short Bible study. To get the most out of it, I'd recommend you do both. You can get all units for free, including videos of the talks and the full printable Bible studies at clayton.tv and God's Big Picture. .co.uk. So we start with the conviction that the Bible is one book. This is absolutely foundational. Of course, it's true that there are 66 books in the Bible, written by about 40 human authors over nearly 2,000 years, and divided into two sections, the Old Testament, written in Hebrew, and the New Testament in Greek. And yet, fundamentally, the Bible is just one book, written by one author, with one main subject and one great story. So first, let's look at the fact that there is one supreme author of the Bible, God. As the Apostle Paul wrote, all scripture is God-breathed. That doesn't mean that God dictated it and the human authors simply wrote it down. No, their books bear the marks of the different personalities and styles of writing. But God ensured by his spirit that they wrote exactly what he wanted them to write. Second, there is one overarching subject that binds the whole Bible together, Jesus Christ. After his resurrection, Jesus met two believers on the road to Emmaus and led them in a Bible study. Luke tells us, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, that's the Old Testament, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now, some Christians seem to believe that God decided to send Jesus to earth only after his first plan hadn't worked. His original idea, plan A, was, they think, to give people an opportunity to become his people by obeying his law. They failed, so only then did he come up in their minds with a different plan, plan B, to save people by grace through Jesus. Nothing could be further from the truth. God had always planned to send Jesus. The whole Bible points to him from beginning to end. In the Old Testament, God promises the future coming of Jesus and points forward to him. And in the New Testament, God proclaims Jesus as the fulfillment of these promises. So the Bible has one supreme author, God, one overarching subject, Jesus Christ, and third, the Bible is one story. The fact that the Bible is one book has big implications for the way in which we read it. It's all part of one story about God's plan to save the world through Jesus. So we always need to read any individual section in the light of the whole, or else it won't make sense. Think of a murder mystery. If I tear it in two and give the beginning to one friend and the end to another, both are gonna be frustrated. The first knows who dies and how, but has absolutely no idea who committed the crime. The second reads, the butler did it but doesn't know what he did. Both parts must be read together. And exactly the same is true of the Bible. The Old Testament on its own is an unfinished story, a promise without a fulfillment. And the New Testament proclaims this fulfillment in ways that only make sense if we know what's come before. What does it mean that Jesus is the Christ, the Passover lamb, or the son of David? The answers are all found in the Old Testament. The next big idea in this course that I want to introduce is the kingdom of God. We'll keep on coming back to this. 
God's kingdom was the chief focus of Jesus' teaching. And it's a binding theme that we can see all the way through the Bible. In taking this as the lens through which we look at scripture, I'm following the lead of Graham Goldsworthy in his excellent book, Gospel and Kingdom. He defines the kingdom like this. God's people, in God's place, under God's rule, and enjoying his blessing. Right at the start, that's what we see in the Garden of Eden. But then human beings disobey God and everything is spoiled. But the kingdom isn't lost forever because God in his great love promises to put things right again and re-establish his kingdom on earth. And all the rest of the Bible tells the story of the fulfillment of that promise, partially in Israel in the Old Testament period and then perfectly through Jesus Christ. This plan of salvation will only finally be complete when Jesus returns at the very end of time. So I've divided the Bible into eight sections. The pattern, the perished, the promised, the partial, the prophesied, the present, the proclaimed, and the perfected kingdom. These are the main periods in God's unfolding plan to restore his kingdom. In the course of this series, we'll look at each in turn and we begin now with the pattern of the kingdom. In Genesis 1 and 2, we're given a magnificent picture of how the world was designed to be. This is the pattern of the kingdom. God's people living in God's place, under God's rule, and enjoying his blessing. And it starts with creation. The Bible begins with the declaration, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God alone is eternal. There's never been a time when God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit did not exist. Then he just said the word, and the universe came into being out of nothing. Bible-believing Christians differ over whether Genesis 1 should be read as poetry or as a literal account, but all agree that God created everything that exists, and so he's the rightful ruler over everything. The writer of Genesis comments, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Matter matters because God made it. He's not just concerned with our souls, but with our bodies and the whole material world as well. On the sixth and final day of creation, we're told, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That means that every single one of us, male and female, young and old, whatever our abilities and social background, have great dignity as those who've been set apart from the rest of the created order. God told mankind to fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now that is certainly not an excuse for abusing the environment, far from it. We're God's stewards, entrusted with the care of his precious creation. Now the climax of the account of creation comes at the start of Genesis 2 with the description, so on the seventh day, he, that's God, rested from all his work. All the other days end with the words, and there was evening, and there was morning, the first, the second day, and so on. But no such end to the seventh day is recorded. It continues. And in a sense, God has rested ever since. That doesn't mean he's not working. He continues to sustain his creation. Without him, everything would fall apart but he rested from his work of creation and he wants human beings to rest with him, enjoying his perfect creation in that seventh day. Genesis 2, 4 to 25, goes on to show what that looks like. It provides us with a second account of creation, certainly not contradicting, but complementing the first, with the focus very much on humanity. God's design for the world is described. Here is the pattern of the kingdom, marked by a wonderful series of perfect relationships. The first perfect relationship is between God and human beings. He lovingly places Adam in a garden and provides for all his needs, including the creation of woman to be his helper and companion. Adam and Eve are given great responsibility, but God remains in charge. His rule is not oppressive, it's for their good. He issues just one prohibition, which is designed to protect them. You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. 
The relationship of the man and the woman is also perfect. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. They enjoy complete intimacy without fear or guilt. Just imagine it. And the relationship between human beings and the created order is also perfect. They obey God's instructions in Genesis 2 verse 15, both to work the land and take care of it. Under their oversight, all God's creation works together in harmony to bring glory to him. It's an idyllic panorama. So in Genesis 2, we see this series of perfect relationships, how everything was meant to be. Here we find how our theme of God's kingdom was set up. The pattern of the kingdom, God's people, Adam and Eve, living in God's place, the Garden of Eden, under God's rule and enjoying the blessing of perfect relationships. If only it was still like that. Sadly, it's not long before everything is spoiled by human sin, as we'll see in our next study, the perished kingdom. But we can take heart because this pattern of the kingdom isn't lost for good. From the very beginning, God has been at work to re-establish his perfect kingdom and call a people back to the wonderful rest of that seventh day. And that is the big picture of the Bible that we'll be tracing through the rest of our course. Sper din toată inima că v-ați format o imagine sintetică asupra întregii scripturi folosind conceptul de împărăție a lui Dumnezeu. Îngăduiți-mă însă, la sfârșitul acestei emisiuni, să am trei lucruri pe care vreau să le punctez pentru dumneavoastră. Mai întâi, dacă scriptura este o carte unică, întrebarea este, e ea unică și pentru noi, sau în alte cuvinte, ocupă ea un loc unic în viața noastră? Am citit pe scrollul unei televiziuni că meditația vindecă izolarea. Am stat să urmăresc despre ce meditație era vorba, din păcate nu era deloc o meditație la cuvântul lui Dumnezeu. Încurajarea pentru dumneavoastră este tocmai aceasta. Haideți să învățăm să cugetăm și să medităm la cuvântul lui Dumnezeu. Iosua spunea despre el, cartea aceasta a legii, să nu se depărteze de gura ta, cuget asupra ei zi și noapte. E atât de important să folosim acest timp ca un timp în care să cugetăm la cuvântul lui Dumnezeu. Să fim preocupați să-L înțelegem. Să fim preocupați să îi pătrundem tainele. A doua aplicație. Dacă ceea ce ni s-a prezentat este planul lui Dumnezeu, strâns în jurul conceptului de împărăție, atunci întrebarea simplă pentru fiecare din noi și pentru toți cei care ne urmăresc este aceasta. Suntem noi parte a acestei împărății? Nu, n-am pretenția că materialul sau vorbele mele ar putea să rezolve multiplele întrebări pe care le avem în jurul conceptului de împărăția lui Dumnezeu. Și totuși, suntem îndemnați ca un copil să primim realitatea aceasta împărăției. Dacă Dumnezeu are un plan și planul acesta se duce la îndeplinire, întrebarea pentru toți cei care mă ascultă este, suntem noi parte? A acestui plan? Al treilea lucru. Dacă suntem preocupați să adâncim cuvântul lui Dumnezeu, vreau să nu uitați că în adâncirea cuvântului lui Dumnezeu vom putea găsi nenumărate comori. Îngăduiți-mi să vă citesc un cuvânt din Iacov, capitolul 1, versetul 25. Dar cine își va adânci privirile în legea desăvârșită, care este legea slobozeniei, și va stărui în ea, nu ca un ascultător uituc, ci ca un împlinitor cu fapta, va fi fericit în lucrarea lui. Ca să vină în ajutorul celor care vor să adâncească, în timpul ultimei melodii a acestei emisiuni, pe ecran vor apărea câteva întrebări la care ar fi bine să luăm seama. 
le poți discuta cu ceilalți din casă, poți să meditezi tu asupra lor și în felul acesta vei fi cu siguranță mult mai câștigat. Prin Harul Lui Dumnezeu vă aștept și mâine seară la ora 18 când vom parcurge împreună un alt material din seria Planul General al Lui Dumnezeu strâns în jurul conceptului Împărăției Lui Dumnezeu.